Okay, great. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, today we will go over a bunch of Wireshark things and uh, a couple of items in the HTTP Wireshark Lab. And so the PDF for the Wireshark Lab, it goes as a companion uh, to the Carosa Ross networking book. Um, you know, if you're off by an edition, it doesn't really uh, do anything. It wasn't very much change between the two versions. And so let me just bring Wireshark to the foreground. And Wireshark is a so-called packet sniffer. And a packet sniffer is a piece of software for those who've not taken computer networking uh, that allows you to analyze uh, chunks of data that are swirling across the network. And it doesn't matter if it's a wired network or wireless network, uh, the packet sniffer uh, attaches ultimately to your network card and it intercepts uh, these packets and it understands the packet structure for all sorts of protocols and presents them to you in a nice interface where you can analyze, you can interrogate, you can examine um, various pieces of information. And now packet sniffer Wireshark is one of the more popular ones, it's free, but many people in the open source community have added to its capabilities with all sorts of interesting uh, analysis tools. And sort of as a side uh, piece of information, I've had students in the past um, who have uh, gotten gainful employment uh, doing computer networking uh, stuff because of their uh, mastery of Wireshark. Uh, so it really is a serious tool. Um, that being said, let me start the so-called packet capture. When we go to the menu, the capture menu, um, it will bring up a pop-up. Let me share that pop-up. And let me share, uh, shift. Okay. Can everyone see the pop-up box? Yes? No? Yes, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and so one of the things you'll see in the capture option um, is the type of information you can capture as well as the so-called interface you can capture on. And so here, if you look at Wi-Fi EN2, every uh, network card has a so-called interface name and this interface name uh, is usually text. Uh, and it describes or gives a name to the network interface. And so one of the things you need to do when you do a capture is specify the interface uh, that you're going to use. Uh, if you're on wireless, on the Mac OS, uh, I'm uh, using my uh, Mac uh, desktop connected by wireless, it'll be one of the ENs, EN0, EN1, EN2. Now you'll notice here that there's actual traffic going across this uh, EN2 interface. Uh, its type is Ethernet. Ethernet is a type of link layer. And uh, you'll notice this sort of looks like a heart signal. It's live. It's actually showing that data is coming in. There's another address you'll see here marked loopback. Now loopback is that special address uh, that is assigned uh, for communication that's going to use uh, the network uh, sockets uh, to communicate with processes on the same machine. And the reason for loopback address is because there's an optimization that bypasses all of the IO and infrastructure for the network card, which is relatively slow, um, and it uses shared memory uh, to do networking. Because if you are going from a process uh, uh, connecting, a client connecting to a server that's on the same machine, you don't need to go through the network card, you use shared memory, and it's a lot faster. And so for that reason, there's a separate so-called loopback address uh, on the interface. And so one of the things you do when you start Wireshark uh, is to set the interface that you're going to listen to. And the Wireshark software will talk to the network card driver uh, and it'll scrape packets directly from the network card. Now, when you examine packets, there are two different ways in Wireshark speak that you can examine packets uh, data coming onto your network. Now I'm connected to a wireless network at home and Spectrum Internet is my wireless provider. I hate Spectrum, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so you are, I am directly connected wirelessly to all the other wireless devices uh, in my house. And so that being the case, when you listen to packets, 
you Ethernet is so-called broadcast-based um, link layer. And for that reason, whether it's wireless Ethernet or wired Ethernet, uh, you can see all of the traffic uh, that are on the same network, those directly connected devices. And so when you look down below, you see a little checkbox that says enable uh, promiscuous mode on all the interfaces. Now in Wireshark speak, when you're in so-called promiscuous mode, as they call it, it means you can see all of the packets for every device that's on your network. Uh, and so it means you'll see a lot more traffic, not just the packets that are leaving your machine and entering your machine, you'll also see all the packets that are in the local area network. And this is where it gets interesting, right? Uh, let's say you're at a coffee shop, you're at an airport uh, and so forth. That means you can see in permissionless mode all the data for everyone on the network around you uh, in the airport and lots of interesting things that you can see. Uh, you can tell a lot about somebody um, based on the network traffic. And in fact, people's behavior is not random, uh, it's stochastic, right? There's some regularity to it. And so, you know, take for example, you know, you might come to the campus center at around a certain time, plus or minus 15 minutes or so, um, maybe go to the dining hall. And so when you join the network, it's really important to be aware of what this network is and what sort of information you're pushing out, which is why information security is a really, really important thing, because you can tell a lot about somebody based on the network traffic. So let's say, you know, you get to the dining hall around like 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, plus or minus uh, some Delta, uh, and then you like to check your bank balance while you're sitting down eating breakfast or what have you. So if I'm somewhere on the network and I'm running in promiscuous mode, I can see your packets and I can see that you're going to, you know, TD Bank, for example. And if you're not careful, um, I can certainly see your MAC address. So I know what your machine identity is, and I know a little bit about your behavior, and I know what bank you're connecting to. And so if you're not careful, I could um, intercept some packets, and I could put up a website on my machine to make you think you're connecting to TD Bank when you're really connecting to me. And certainly I can forward your uh, request to TD Bank, but I'll make a copy, especially when you type your username and password. Uh, so there's lots and lots of things that people can do um, with all this information. And that just says that you wanna be very, very careful about information security. Okay, um, so that being said, let me go ahead and start. And I'm gonna start uh, by capturing packets uh, on my wireless network uh, at home. And there's a ton of traffic happening. And so one of the fields, let me stop this capture. There's just a lot of information swirling by. There we go, stop. Um, there are a bunch of fields uh, that you should be aware of. Let me scroll all the way up. Um, ah, let's see, all the way up, okay. And so you'll notice along the top here, um, below the icon and below the search field, you'll see a number of column headings. One, the first one, NO is the packet number, and that's in sequence. So the first packet this, uh, uh, that my machine received, the second, the third, and so forth, and that's in sequential order. Next is the time, right? And that's the uh, timestamp uh, in, I forgot the, the, the unit, might be milliseconds. Um, that's the time at which these packets arrive. And so one could compute something called the inter-arrival time, and that's one of the statistics you can report with Wireshark of the packets, at what rate are packets coming in uh, to my network. Now, these are packets on my network, so it's not just my machine, it's all the other devices uh, that are on uh, the network. And then we have the source, uh, and there's this number. This is an IP internet protocol address. Um, we will talk about that in the balance of uh, our treatment of networking, but this IP address uniquely identifies uh, the network interface or the network card. Now, I say the network card more than the machine because, you know, years ago, it was assumed you only had a network card, but it's very typical these days for machine to have a minimum of two network cards, one for wired communication and one for wireless communication. Uh, and so here we have the source IP address um, defining or uniquely identifying the source network interface or network card. And then we have the destination IP address and that's the network card associated uh, with the destination endpoint for this communication. 
And so 192.168.229, that's my machine, and I'll kind of show you other parts of uh, the protocol uh, packet interpretation. And the destination, um, we'll do a little bit of sleuthing and try to figure out what this destination might be. Uh, so then if we look at the protocol, that tells you what protocol. This particular protocol, TLS, is called Transport Layer Security version 1.2. Uh, that's a type of, it's not secure socket per se, but it acts a lot like a secure socket. It's an encryption uh, mechanism that straddles the scene between the application layer and the transport layer. And so TLS, Transport Layer Security, is the gen generic um, encryption uh, standard uh, for encrypting data pushed from the application layer into the transport layer. Secure sockets isn't the only encryption standard. And then we have the length of that packet and then some interpretation info um, based on the format, uh, Wireshark will print out a little bit of information that's useful uh, to the type of communication that it is. Okay, any questions about this? That makes sense? Yeah, all right. Uh, so let's take a look at um, this uh, field here. I'm gonna type HTTP for hypertext transfer protocol. And inside of Wireshark are many definitions for many protocols that this thing will interpret. So if I hit return, you'll notice there are no HTTP packets uh, that are being sent. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to bring up my browser um, and let me add my browser to let's see how many let me add my browser to the sharing new share um firefox uh, shift let me add browser okay so firefox is now being shared let me bring it to the foreground and let me say gaia.cs.umass.edu and so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to do a shift reload cuz i was looking at it before and I'm gonna force, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to do packet capture. So let me go back, let me start packet capture. And let me go back to the browser and I'm gonna shift reload. The reason why I hold on shift with reload is that your browser caches or stores content locally uh, as uh, an optimization rather than reaching across the internet, take it locally from the hard drive. If you wanna force the browser to reload something across the internet, you hold down the shift key and you hit reload. And so now that I've done that, let me go back to Wireshark and I'm gonna stop the capture so that it's not capturing all of these packets because there are a lot of uh, communications going on, even if your devices might seem like they're idle. And so, you know, we have, I have Dropbox and so Dropbox feedbacks HTTP. Um, I have a, a printer that has some software that does uh, discovery. Uh, and so it's always uh, pinging, uh, trying to find uh, the printer. So you see those messages. Um, I have a smart device. And so that thing is sometimes phoning home. Um, and so there's lots and lots of traffic. And so it's really important uh, to use this search field uh, to kind of filter out things that you don't want to see because it can pollute everything you're, you're trying to pay attention to. So that being the case here, we have, if we look at the first uh, line, that first packet, packet number one, uh, we have what looks like an HTTP get request. And if we take a look at that get request, what follows that get request on line two is an HTTP response. It was uh, error 202 return code, which is status okay. So that meant first thing is HTTP get, which is the browser when I went to gaia.cs.umass.edu, and then the response was okay. So let's take a look at the get message. And if we look in this bottom window, uh, that's the um, printing out of the protocol information. And you notice there are five pieces of information uh, for each of the five layers. At the bottom, we have layer five, which is application. Up uh, Next, we have the transport layer. Next, we have the network layer. Next, we have the link layer. And then we have the physical layer uh, below it. Let's expand these little drop-down lists here. Let's expand what uh, the application looks, layer looks like. And so here, this is the request line that we talked about. It's a get operation, uh, forward slash that is the root of the file system. So that means the top level folder uh, that the web, web server on gaia.cs.umass.edu uh, manages. 
and then it's protocol version 1.1 for HTTP. And you can see the carriage return backslash R, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, the line feed, uh, which is which is uh, backslash N. So then we have header lines, and the header line host is Gaia.cs.umass.edu, and that's the host name uh, for this machine at UMass. And so here, if the source is my IP address for the get message, and the destination is going to Gaia, so the IP address for Gaia.cs.umass.edu must be this 128.119.245.12. And so we also see user agent is Mozilla, that's Firefox, and it's the version of Firefox running on Mac OS, and it's the Intel version of Mac OS, and I'm running Mac OS version uh, 10.14, uh, which is Mac OS Mojave. I tend not to upgrade very quickly. I only upgrade uh, during the summer because I don't want to, you know, disturb my uh, configuration until uh, there's no teaching happening. Um, but that being said, it shows uh, the version of Mac OS I'm running. It's Firefox, um, browser, Mozilla uh, organization, uh, except language is English and a bunch of other stuff there for the encoding and, and things like that. Okay, any questions about this? No? All right. Uh, so next, if we look at the transport layer, it's using TCP, the reliable transport. And you can see that the source port is 52638. Uh, so that's going to be the source port from a communication. You also Know what the destination port is. And you notice here the destination port on gaia.cs.umass.edu, which has IP address 128.109.245.12, that destination port is port 80, which is the standard HTTP port. And so there are some things that are unavoidable uh, when you're sniffing packets. You could absolutely, for example, encrypt uh, this HTTP information, but what you can't avoid is the port numbers that transport layer information as well as this um, network layer information. So if we open up the uh, network layer information, the source IP address, that's my machine, 192.168.1.229, and the destination is 128.109.245.12. Uh, and then lastly, if we look at the MAC or the link layer information, um, it will give you the source MAC address, which is the MAC address for my machine, and that's unique um, on the network. And then this destination is the MAC address for my router, because it'll tell you the different hops uh, to get. Uh, for, you don't get the MAC address for the destination machine. You get the MAC address for the destination for wherever this packet is going to go, this message, this HTTP message is going to go on my network. And so you start out going from your machine uh, to what's called um, the default gateway, which is your first hop router to get uh, information off of your network to the network that follows that, and that's onto the service provider's network. Okay, any questions about this? That makes sense? Yeah, all right. So the other thing, um, when you look at network um, arrangements or topologies, we talked about this fact that you can go from one network through a router to another network through a router. Uh, so I'm going to bring up my uh, terminal. Hopefully, you can still see the terminal. Can you still see the terminal? Yes? No? Yes? OK, thank you. Um, so in the terminal, there are a, a bunch of tools. Uh, one of the things I'm going to show you are the set of interfaces. Um, if config dash a on Unix, it'll show you a list of all of the uh, interfaces available available on your machine. Now, L0, that's the interface name for the so-called loopback address. And if you look at this INET specification, that's the IP version 4 IP address. And so this IP address 127.0.0.1, that's the specialized IP address specifically for loopback address. And so if you had a client and a server running on the same physical machine, you would associate the server with the loopback address and associate the client with the loopback address. And the system will, under the covers, use these optimizations of shared memory instead of actually pushing data to the network card, only to have it go back to the same machine. Uh, so then we also see EN2, 
which is uh, the network card I'm using. I have more than one network card. I have wired, I have two wirelesses and no, actually two wired network cards and one wireless network card on my desktop machine running a Mac Pro uh, at home. And so if we look at EM2, that's um, um, Airport Extreme, which is Apple's name for their uh, wireless network card. And if we look at the internet uh, IP address, it's INET, which is IP version four, uh, which is 192.168.1.229. And of course that matches up with the source IP address as reported uh, by a Wireshark. Now, the first thing that happens when I send information out onto the internet is it goes off to my router and then into the infrastructure for my service provider and then ultimately makes its way to UMass, uh, which is on a different service provider. Um, and one of the tools that are useful for tracing all of the routers along the pathway between your machine and the destination machine is so-called trace route. So if I say which, oops, trace route, it's there on my machine, I already checked before, uh, but on Windows, it'll be trace RT, right? And you have to make sure that's installed and uh, the network tools are available on your Windows installation. Uh, trace route is also on Linux. And if I run trace route, Gaia.cs.umass.edu, it'll report all of the routers um, along the pathway between your machine and the machine on the, at, at the destination. And so what Traceroute does is it issues a series of probes, and I won't get into the detail of those probes, and it increases the radius over which these probes travel. And when it hits a router that's a certain distance or number of hops away, the router will report back uh, three numbers because it sends three probes. And this is the round trip time uh, in milliseconds, how far away time-wise it takes to send packets to that destination. Now, one of the things you'll see here along uh, the left-hand column, you'll see a number and that's the hop. And so one hop means traversing one router in order to get to another network. And so the hop number will tell you how many hops away and Gaia.cs.umass.edu in this route is 21 hops away. That's quite a bit of, uh, of hops. And the next thing it'll give you in the next column is a text name of the host, which is the router uh, name um, for that particular router for that hop. Now, next to that, you also see the IP address for that router. And so every host, whether that's a router, every device, has an IP address, well, every router or host does, link layer switches don't have IP addresses. And so you'll see first the text name, and then you'll see the IP address for that particular router. And so then the next three entries will be three measurements in milliseconds, and that's the, num the distance time-wise it takes to get to that router. So the first probe took 1.9 milliseconds, the second probe took 0.77, the third probe took 0.73. Now, of course, if you can identify an entity on the internet, you can also attack that entity. And some providers consider it a security risk to report back the name and the IP address for a router. And so in this trace route trace, you'll notice that some of the routers along the way don't report back um, this information. And so it's entirely up to the system administrator that runs the network uh, to decide whether or not it's gonna respond uh, to these trace route um, message probes. And so you'll notice here, first we start out with this router, o OS uh, NY, N -Y -N -C, um, OSYNC, um, which is 192.168.1.1. That's my default gateway. That's the router in my house, right? And so it's pretty quick to go to the router in my house. And then you notice my router goes to some router that is in Spectrum's um, service provider network. And so that is my default gateway, my router. And the second one, second hop, that's the connection into um, Spectrum's uh, network. And they chose to not publish that information because they felt if you can get the access network's router, uh, that, that's a security risk for whatever reason they've chosen not to do that. So next, you go through 
uh, a set of um, hops going from the regional ISP uh, access network ISP to the regional ISP to the global ISP. And so the next hop three, that's spectrum.com. And that code number means something to Spectrum. I don't know what the schema is, uh, but it's their business uh, uh, network uh, and it's some region of the business network uh, that goes uh, from the service provider access network side to some business network. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because at Hop2, this first one, that's the router in my house. Hop2, that's residential. And now you go from the residential service provider to something that's more regional service provider. So that's gonna be a business connection, not a residential connection. And there's the IP address. And you notice that first probe took 9.25 milliseconds. And you notice that these numbers are increasing as you go further, because as you take subsequent hops, it's gonna take longer uh, for your message to get there. And so then after that, you go from spectrum to charter communication. So spectrum probably has a peering point uh, to exchange data with Charter, and then Charter Communication. Uh, then after hop seven, you go through some other aggregation. Uh, IL might be Illinois, uh, VA is definitely Virginia. And so we go to charter.com, network operation. Uh, and then we go to IL, looks like Illinois, to Virginia. Now, this might be Los Angeles, I don't know um, specifically. Um, Los Angeles is big enough that you would probably have a fairly sizable network uh, serving Los Angeles. You'd have to do some more investigation to see if this IP address really is an LA uh, part of the network. Now, why would they go all the way to Illinois and then to Virginia? It all depends on what is the fastest route uh, because when you push packets down the wire, uh, TCP tends to prefer uh, the pathway that is the most lightly loaded because data flows faster over a lightly loaded path. And so at the time when I did this trace route, it's very likely that going to Illinois and then going to Virginia um, happened to be the most lightly loaded path, even though geographically it might not make sense. It's not geographics that determine your route, uh, it's how much traffic is on the network and it looks for the least traffic laden pathway. And so here after uh, Virginia, we go to some uh, backbone uh, and we go from charter communication to Comcast. So now there's some peering point uh, where traffic from charter is being exchanged um, either through a financial agreement or a bandwidth agreement between charter and Comcast. And so we go through um, Virginia infrastructure for hop eight, nine, 10. Um, and then we go from Virginia to New Jersey, uh, Newark, New Jersey uh, and Newark, New Jersey as another large section of Comcast network. Uh, Comcast, by the way, is headquartered in Philadelphia. Uh, and so we go to another section uh, of Comcast network, route to a yet another section in New Jersey, Comcast network. It might be in the same data center, might be in a different data center. And then here for hop 13, uh, don't really know where that is. Uh, they're not reporting the name, but they're certainly reporting the IP address. So we go through a few more hops, uh, 13, 14, to 15, and then hop 16, um, they choose not to report that particular um, name or number. And that's probably the ser service provider to get onto UMass. UMass has a pretty significant network security research group, and I'm sure they inform the decisions for the University of Massachusetts uh, system, which has multiple campuses. All right, so then here, we go into the core network for UMass EDU. Uh, and that's here at hop 17. And then we go around campus somewhere to different parts and Kix is the College of Information and Computer Sciences. Um, they're substantial enough to have their own partition on the network. So this works its way to UMass system, uh, to the College of Computer and Information Sciences. And then from there, it goes uh, subdivided for the research group for computer networking to the actual machine Gaia that CS, that UMass, that EDU. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. And so this trace route tool is used to show you the pathway to get between a source and destination endpoint. And if I were to do this again, let's try it again, it will probably choose a different pathway. And so just to jar your memory, we went from look like LA to Illinois, to Virginia, to New Jersey. So let's see what we get if we try this again. 
Um, all right, so that's my default gateway. And then next we're gonna go to um, the service provider for residential. So we have LA, Illinois, Virginia, New Jersey. So it looks like that persists pretty nicely. Uh, but you will see that the timing is a little bit different from when we did this before. And then it looks like once you get to UMass's network again, they don't want you to know the identity of their uh, border gateway servers. And then we get onto UMass campus networks, and then we eventually make it to KICS, and then we make it to the networks research uh, groups server, um, router, I mean, and then we make it onto Gaia. Um, any questions about this? No questions? And so this is just to show you that underlying what we see in Wireshark, this connection between my machine 192.168.1.229 to this destination 128.109.245.12 for Gaia, underlying this is a significant number of routers in between that are storing and forwarding uh, my packets uh, from my machine ultimately to Gaia, and then along the reverse path. It doesn't always have to be the reverse path. It could be some um, variation in the pathways. Okay, any questions about this? No? Does that make sense? So another, I'm just out of curiosity, want to see, um, trace route clark.edu. So let's look at the main web server for Clark, and we will see what, Clark reports, and that should take a lot less time. Oh, that travels all over the place. That's interesting. All right, so we see um, Spectrum to Charter. It takes a different route. Um, Missouri, California, Washington, um, Gigapop, I'm not sure what that is. Infrastructure. So it takes a bunch of, uh, there we go, Clark, we're on Clark's network here. So whoever Clark's provider is, it looks like it's going through Washington for me to get there, even though Clark is only about 15 miles away from me. Um, and Clark doesn't like to, at least this trunk line, they don't like to report uh, their routes, so they're nice and secure. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna let this complete. It might take a while to report. Okay, so that being said, um, Traceroute is a tool that you can use uh, to enumerate all of the routers, most of the routers, some of the routers, depending on security, between you and a destination. Um, uh, let's see, ping is another command that you can use uh, to test the round trip time between you and a destination. So I said ping uh, gaia.cs.umass.edu, it sends a timing message, and this is the end-to-end -end time. Uh, and so um, this last column is the time. So it takes about 35 to 36 milliseconds. And if I do the ping for clark.edu, that's probably gonna be longer. So even though UMass is much further away than Clark, uh, the round trip time uh, for Clark is longer. So that means they're gonna be increased delays uh, to get the Clark's network. Um, I could trace route white house, thought, got, maybe that's not a good idea. I'm not doing anything wrong. But um, in this era of geopolitics that are happening now and cyber attacks, I'm sure they're logging my IP address and my service provider as I trace the route to whitehouse.gov because someone might think that I'm trying to discover uh, network infrastructure um, to launch a potential attack, which I'm not. Um, but you know, different providers log all sorts of information and I would fully expect a whitehouse.gov and all um, federal systems uh, to log lots of information. And so that just goes without saying that your connection is not anonymous. You still need an IP address and you need a MAC address and you connect in through some service provider. So at a minimum, uh, someone can trace the IP address that you use to the service provider 
along with the time, it's just a little simple logging, and then get a subpoena and query those records and try to pinpoint whom it was that initiated a message. And so where well, you might think your communication is private, but it's not entirely private. And most of these service providers uh, will furnish uh, data to authorities upon uh, court order. Okay, um, so that being said, let me stop there. And you'll notice as I get closer uh, to whitehouse.gov, you'll notice there are a lot more of these routers that do not respond. Okay, any question? No questions? That makes sense? All right, so that's sort of driving around um, the internet, uh, relating some pieces of what you'd see in Wireshark to the internet. And the rest is really just following um, the lab, right? Um, it's very well written, and these exercises are companions uh, to the book uh, for the labs uh, using Wireshark, and it walks you through very nicely um, all the different exercises to look at different things like authentication, um, the request response, uh, it shows you different parts of Wireshark, uh, as well as some exercises for things like conditional get, um, as well as uh, long documents. Now, when you retrieve something that is long, uh, a data source, um, that data source is broken up into multiple packets, and you'll actually see that reflected in Wireshark. Um, when you send uh, data over different networks, uh, that datagram uh, will get chopped up, called fragmented, into smaller datagrams, and you'll see that reflected in Wireshark. And then also when you authenticate, uh, type in a name and password, uh, you'll actually see information uh, that's swirling back and forth, hashed information. And so um, this is sort of a whirlwind view of the lab exercise, and I'll leave that to you uh, to go through, uh, but I thought at a minimum, it'd be really important just to show you uh, around different parts of Wireshark uh, as well as um, some internet infrastructure pieces as well. Okay, any questions about this? No questions? All right, um, so if we were in person, I would just have you fire stuff up and we'd do some other exercises in the lab, um, but we're gonna leave it at that and I will leave it to you to go through the exercise. Please make sure you go through um, at least the first two sections, uh, the conditional get, and um, driving around Wireshark for the basic uh, get uh, response interaction. I won't test you on it, but um, you will use this stuff in the future um, with uh, the networking portion when we connect the Arduino uh, and the uh, Raspberry Pi later to the network, because you'll be using this to debug uh, your protocols that piggyback on HTTP. Okay. If there are no final questions, any questions? No? No questions? All right, uh, so I guess I am between you and your weekend. Um, travel safely, um, enjoy the snow if you uh, like snow. I think snow is not bad. Uh, so let me stop the recording.